Thank you very much. So it's self-evident that we live in a world that has been completely changed in the past 50 years by our ability to write and program in digital code. I'm going to talk to you today about a code that stores information more densely than any human invented technology, drives the biology of every cell in your body every day of your life, and it's going to be a big chunk of the future of medicine. Uh, my name is Jeff, and it's really a delight to be here. Um, the, that code is, of course, DNA. And all of us are born with millions of slides of code like this, three billion base pairs from each of our parents. And while we've made amazing progress in reading this code over the last 20 years, from the first human genome sequence to million sequence today, we have made a lot less progress in writing this code. So a case in point is if you're a child born tomorrow and you are missing these 10 pink letters, you probably won't get to see your first birthday. But if we could write those letters into that exact location, this child's life changes completely. They get to live a healthy life. Um, perhaps their family will never even remember the name of the disease that they were born with. That, that is the defining aspiration of what we're doing at Tessera and the field of genetic medicine. And uh, you could make a case that as a field, we've spent the past hundred years climbing up what's called the central, do central dogma of life. Information in life flows from DNA to mRNA to the engines of life called proteins. And the foundation of medicine as we know it has sort of oriented from, from right to left. Small molecules that drug proteins, proteins themselves became therapeutics with the birth of biotech. We've all seen society saving mRNA vaccines over the course of the past couple of years. And now the first cures are taking place at the level of DNA. That is just the very beginning of the left-hand side of this slide, in that if you're trying to cure a disease or prevent disease from ever happening, DNA is going to be the rightful home for many of those medicines. And uh, as mentioned, we're, we're 10 years into a revolution set off by Emanuela Charpentier, Jennifer Doudna, and Feng Zhang's molecular characterization of the amazing programmable pair of scissors that you're seeing here with the catchy acronym CRISPR. And um, CRISPR is an immune system of sorts in microbes. It chops up invasive DNA by grabbing onto an RNA that helps them to recognize it. And the characterization of this and, and its use in human cells has given us the, the first pair of scissors through which you can programmably break the human genome in specific locations. When you break the genome, our cells don't like that. Uh, they typically turn off the gene where that break took place. And prior to this, scientists didn't have a tool through which you could just roam through the halls of the genome and turn off light switches like a, like a curious child one at a time and figure out you know, how the control system works. And for a subset of patients, this offers the potential for a clinical cure. If you have a pre-written error that causes a gene to become toxic, turning that gene off can be life-saving. Most genetic errors, though, uh, cause genes to turn off. And, and therefore, turning them off again wouldn't be the right therapeutic intervention. It'd be like unplugging a broken technology in your house. To fix those, um, you typically have to be able to do more than cut. You need to be able to write. And so six years ago, ahead of the formation of Tessera, we asked the question that, all right, if a big chunk of the future of medicine is going to require us to write DNA, then let's go looking for machinery that might have spent billions of years evolving the ability to do just that. We quickly realized that we were thinking too little of Mother Nature to even ask the question. So of course she invented technology to do this. And they're kind of like the smallest circle of life. So these are called mobile genetic elements. And they are sequences of DNA that encode one or more proteins that can grab onto a DNA or an RNA copy of themselves and then very efficiently write that into a new location. So some of you may know a famous book called The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins 40 years ago. The concept was that our human genome is us, and it's like a village that thousands of life forms live inside of called genes, and natural selection is acting on their survival as well. Well, when you think about life that way, the prospect of sequences of DNA, figuring out how to make a copy of themselves and then move into new homes in the real estate of DNA is, is unsurprising. And, and like most uh, areas of science that have the potential to be a medical breakthrough, this one has a phenomenal legacy in that the first mobile genetic element 
was hypothesized and discovered by Barbara McClintock before the 3D structure of DNA was even known. She uh, was squinting at gels, characterizing the divergent mosaic colors in maize, wondering why the altered pigmentation takes place. And she had the bravery to hypothesize that a chunk of DNA had the machinery to be able to jump from one place to another and drive that alteration of pigmentation. Uh, she described that her hypothesis for a couple of decades was met with confusion and even hostility. Um, decades later, it was validated to be true, and uh, she was given the first unshared Nobel Prize for a woman at the age of 81 in 1983. Um, we now know that these are the most abundant sequences in all of life, as we know. They are all over the place. So that's our human genome. 2% of it codes for proteins, which are the engines of life. And half our human genome was built by mobile genetic elements, one at a time hopping around constructing the, the life that we enjoy. Similar chunks of the animal kingdom, plant kingdom, and beyond. So if you think of the abundance of a sequence in all genomes in nature as a proxy for how much lab space Mother Nature gave that pet project, she gave more of the lab to mobile genetic elements than anything else. And therefore, they've benefited from more opportunity for optimization and diversification over the last three billion years than any other machine in, in, in our living world. So um, the question that we realized was more apt was not, do these exist? Of course they do. Um, it was, oh my God, where do you start? Which of these still work and didn't break down millions of years ago and is sitting in uh, a genome as luggage? Of the ones that still work, which could work on the human genome? Of those, which can we devise ways of programming? so that they are inserting a therapeutic sequence at a desired location and not themselves, which would have the ability to be able to jump around. But that is probably a Jurassic Park style bad idea. And so as a testament to the era of biology that we are all in um, and the platform we've built at Tessera, we've been able to synthesize and test over 40,000 distinct gene writers, as we call them, in human cells over the past several years. We've now automated this, so these numbers are going up faster than they were at the beginning which is gratifying. And uh, this is a combination of mobile genetic elements that we computationally discover from genomes across the tree of life, and ones that we engineer so that we can alter their properties, so that they can go to a programmable location and insert a programmable therapeutic sequence. And mostly as a testament to Mother Nature's ingenuity, we've been able to do some things that we think are extraordinary. So we've been able to create gene writers that can do everything from change any one base pair into any other. So change an A to a T, A to a G, A to a C, and vice versa. That by itself could comprise a cure for most rare genetic disorders on a patient by patient basis. And diseases like sickle cell, which is the most abundant genetic disease on the planet, called by, caused by a single letter being wrong in the genome. We've created versions that can programmably insert and delete. For example, that has applications in reinserting the three nucleotides that are missing in most cystic fibrosis patients. And then we've sort of doubled down on the ability to write entire genes into the genome. Uh, we are searching and working across each of the major biochemistries of mobile genetic elements. So these fall into what are called retrotransposons, where a sequence of DNA makes an RNA copy of itself and then writes that RNA back into the form of DNA. From those, we've created what we call RNA gene writers. And those systems, can be engineered, it turns out, to make each of the modifications that you see here. DNA gene writers come from the other two categories, transposons and recombinases, and those are probably exclusively well, well suited to putting whole genes into a given location. In fact, some of the machinery we're working with evolved to paste sequences of DNA that are 100 times larger than the average human gene. And you have to get pretty creative to contemplate how to use that therapeutically. So this is how RNA gene writers work. And I want you to contrast this with the action of, of nature's programmable scissors in that this is like a programmable pen. So an RNA gene writer grabs onto an RNA that we administer. It goes to the genome and recognizes a specific location. It nicks one strand that provides the opportunity for the RNA to anneal at that location, base by base recognizing the site. That then activates a reverse transcriptase domain that one letter at a time writes a DNA sequence corresponding to that RNA strand. 
that then goes over and completes the second strand synthesis. So this is this exemplifies the advantage of letting Mother Nature spend a couple billion years getting a head start on a problem. Like the life of this machinery, so to speak, survived on the basis of figuring out how to do these steps autonomously. And we've created versions of these that can change single base pairs, as I mentioned, and write entire genes. And in the latter, it offers the potential for the kind of compositions we all experienced in SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, lipid nanoparticle with RNAs, to write DNA genes into cells in our body. So a redosable, safe therapeutic that's now been administered as a format to more people than all protein therapeutics put together offers the potential to be the chassis for a large fraction of the future of genetic medicine. But I'm going to show you the other side of the continuum here, which is changing just one letter. So if you're born with this T in this location in your genome, you can't metabolize an essential amino acid called phenylalanine. And so a normal diet causes phenylalanine to accumulate to levels that cause severe neurotoxicity. In fact, for children that have two T's inherited from both of their parents, a single slice of bread would overwhelm their daily capacity for metabolism. Um, this is an important indication to us for two reasons. One is, it's one of the areas that we're going to develop a gene writing medicine. The second is that this is Jacob. Jacob is the son of one of our teammates at Tessera. And Jacob was born with one of these T's. He's fortunate for a bunch of reasons. One is that he uh, was born with one of these T's and not both. But even with one, his phenylalanine levels are about 10 times what they would normally be. He's also fortunate uh, in that his grandmother is an MD, PhD, pediatrician, and geneticist. And that's, you know, a useful set of resources to have in the household. As his parents uh, would say, the, no matter what your expectations when you're expecting a child on the day of their birth, what you're mostly hoping for is that they are healthy. And um, the nature of this disease, which is called PKU, um, is that if you can correct 10% of the cells in the liver from having those T's to having none, or having one to having none, you would provide a lifelong cure to patients with this disease. In our preclinical work, we're already at an efficiency five times higher than that. So correcting 50% of hepatocytes for the ability to be able to metabolize, to, to, to reestablish appropriate metabolism of this amino acid. So um, Jacob isn't alone. Uh, he's one of an estimated 300 million people around the world that have a genetic inborn disease. And um, what's exciting about this area of therapeutic development is there's going to be programmable relationships between any success and the ability to extend into other indications. We've seen this in CRISPR scientifically and now clinically, and this is going to extend to many technologies in this realm. So just within the liver where we're working on multiple indications concurrently, there's about a half million patients that could benefit from these. And every time you open up a new cell type with the ability to deliver in the body, you open up a new category of medicine. So HSCs are hematopoietic stem cells. That is the location where one would want to uh, make the correction that causes all of sickle cell disease. We are similarly able to do that with a correction to wild type with higher efficiencies, uh, with multifold higher efficiencies than would be needed for a clinical cure. In T cells, we're using a different version of RNA gene writers, which can write an entire gene into the genome of T cells by administering a lipid nanoparticle composition. So imagine a lipid nanoparticle that can go to T cells in your bloodstream and program them to express a chimeric receptor that allows them to go after cancer cells. That takes the infrastructure that has comprised the clinical cure of the past decade and allows it to be administered directly to the bloodstream instead of having a month of engineering outside of the body. So, so all of that is about trying to combat existing disease. And I'm going to give you one more hint of how vast genetic medicine can become. And it's embedded in the experience that all of us have every time we take a vaccine, including the mRNA vaccine in that the way all vaccines work is that they instruct a subset of your cells called B cells to produce a protect, to change their genome and produce a protective factor that prevents future disease. As we begin to write into the code of cells across our body, the potential to prevent disease from ever happening 
extends well beyond infectious disease into the kind of indications that many of our loved ones will die. So here are two examples of the potential to be able to prevent disease from ever occurring. So already from millions of human genomes sequenced around the world, which is headed to billions, there are examples like what you see here, which is that if you could put a stop codon at that location on the left, you would provide vaccine-like protection against someone ever having a heart attack. If you could write the two pink T's on the right, you would provide similar protection against ever having Alzheimer's disease. So, so not only does our genome inherently offer the ability to cure genetic vulnerability to disease, it offers the potential to prevent some of the most important diseases from ever happening. So one of the amazing aspects of our venue is you can go just down the hallway and see glimpses of medicine 100 years ago. As you roll the clock forward by many decades, I'd like you to imagine what the field of genetic medicine can potentially offer to all of us. It is going to be extraordinary. Thank you very much.